in modern America, you know, divorce, it didn't used to be this way. There used to be a time, and it's still that way in Japan, when divorce was, was really rare. But in modern America, for better or ill, divorce has lost its stigma. Just a, a generation ago, two generations ago, divorce was rare. And children from broken families were a minority. And uh, Yumi was a teacher in Japan for six, six years? Eight years, sorry. A uh, teacher in Japan for eight years. And she said you could almost always tell the children that came from broken families because they're, they're dealing with difficulty. This idea that, that uh, I see some of the other people that work with kids nod their heads. The idea that divorce doesn't affect children is, is not true. Today, children growing up in a home, though, with a mom and dad, uh, that they are now a minority. Isn't that kind of scary? Children that are growing up in a home with a mom and dad, their mom and dad, that's a minority. And children are being raised oftentimes by their grandparents because their moms don't know what to do and their dads are long gone. The world wants to say, don't call it a broken family. It's another alternative of family. Well, is, if the church doesn't stand up and say this, broken, this brokenness, all this divorce is wrong, then who is going to stand up and say it? Divorce is wrong. God wants us to be together. It, it, uh, and it really does make me fear for the next generation of children. Think about this. All these little kids being raised by grandma because mom doesn't know how to do it. Dad's gone because he's a loser. What's going to happen to the next generation of kids when grandma's gone? We're heading for disaster. Quick. What's going to happen when not even grandma and grandpa know how to raise the kids in a stable, loving family? Dr. Dobson has pointed out that in cultures where divorce becomes commonplace or large numbers of men and women choose to live together or copulate without bothering to marry, million, untold millions of kids are caught in the chaos. Now, this is a hard topic. And uh, I've often said that churches find it very comfortable because uh, homosexuality is about 2%, maybe 1%, depending on who you ask, maybe less, of the population. So you got a lot of churches up there, and the pastor gets grooving, and those oh, homosexuals, he, he blasts them because he's not too worried about what's going on in his congregation. But you know, about, about half of Americans are divorced. It's about the same in the Christian culture. So you see a lot of pastors, they get up here, they're looking at their congregation, half the folks are divorced. And they kind of get afraid to say what, you know what we'd always do? We're just going to preach it and let the chips fall where they may. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one who convicts. The Holy Spirit's the one who talks to us. So my job is to be faithful to the text, right? Can I get amen? My job is to be faithful to the text, and I'm not going to not talk about divorce because it's unpopular to do so. Okay? We're going to talk about it because Jesus Christ spoke about it. But it is a hard topic. Even in the church, we have millions of divorced Christians. That's not the way it should be, but that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And if that's you today, I really do need you to work with me, whether you're here or whether you're watching on television, please work with me. It's really important that you understand that God's love for you is not based upon our obedience. Because everything, if you get that, you're going to be able to listen to the rest of the sermon. But if you're feeling convicted, if you're not convicted, if you're feeling crucified, if you're feeling judged, it might, not be, it might be because we're not remembering and holding on tightly to grace. So, Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, you know, the very first Christians, the very first generation of Christians in the Didache, uh, this is possibly written by the apostles themselves. It's not in the scriptures, but it's one of the earliest Christian documents. They talk about how Christians don't leave their elderly out to be exposed and killed, and Christians don't uh, kill their babies. There's no infanticide or abortion among Christians. Uh, Right away, uh, God says in the Bible that lying is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Jesus took a step further. He says, 
even look on somebody lustfully, you're guilty of adultery. Murder is a sin, oh yeah. Jesus said, you just hate somebody, wish their life was ruined. Jesus said, in your heart, you're murdering them. That's a sin. The Bible says, he's listing all of this, the great sins, and everybody says, oh, adultery, sin, murder, sin, yeah, theft, sin. The, Jesus, the Bible says, gossip. Listen, right up there with the rest of them. Sin. The Bible says God hates divorce. No. Have you ever told a lie even once? Then you're a liar. Have you ever really had trouble wishing well for somebody else? You just wished ill on them? Maybe even if it was for a short time, you were caught up with anger and bitterness and you had a hard time. The Bible says, Jesus says, you're a murderer in your heart. Now, if Jesus can love liars and murderers, do you think there's room in the heart of God, in the family of God, for somebody who has had gone through a difficult relationship, they've gone through a divorce? Do you think God can love people that have gone through divorce? Absolutely, yes. Our relationship with God is not based on our behavior, period. If it was, we'd all go to hell. It's based on the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not based on how worthy we are. It's based upon how worthy the blood of the Lamb is. Do we get it? Are we understanding? It's important for all of us here to understand how much God loves us, uh, even, to, even to scratch the surface a little bit of how much God loves us. Obedience is one way we show our love to God, but his love for us is not based upon our obedience. In other words, Jesus Christ loves you when you are a hero and you're and you're kind, and you're patient, and you're gentle, and you're wise, and you're pouring blessing on other people. He loves you just as much and no more than you are acting like a wicked, selfish, rotten person. Because his love is based upon his merit. It's not based upon ours. Hebrews tells us that Christ did away with sin. He did away with it. Romans tells us that for those of us who have given our lives to God, that there is no more condemnation. No more condemnation. If the Bible says there's no more condemnation, do you know how much condemnation is left? Well, you have to study the Greek here. In the, in the original, if there's no more condemnation, what that means is there is no more condemnation. There, there's nothing left. So if you're feeling judged and this weight of guilt is over you, either you haven't accepted the grace of Christ yet and what's stopping you? Just go do it. Just go get yourself right with the Lord or uh, they, perhaps you're a Christian and you just keep, you keep holding on to the past and what Christ has said, I've dealt with it, it's done, you won't let it go and, and you need to learn to do that. So this morning, uh, this message, and I hope I'm getting this really clear, is not about putting people under guilt and condemnation. That's the devil's work. I don't need to do his work for him. But we are going to preach a clear message that uh, God hates sin and divorce is a sin. What's more, God sends believers his Holy Spirit. You know what that means? God's with us in our lives, his Holy Spirit to comfort us and to instruct us. He knows how hard life can be and the pain that we feel. And he wants you to know that he loves you. And he wants to carry your burdens and heal your wounds. This is the kind of God we have. God is not the one putting screws to us, trying to make every day of our life miserable. That's a misunderstanding of who God is. That's a misunderstanding of grace. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He wants to heal us. He wants to build us. He wants to draw us close to him so that we can live lives that glorify him. So today, as I uphold these high biblical standards, because to do anything less would be sin on my part, as I uphold these high standards for Christian marriage, please work with me and understand that in the church we're trying to accomplish two goals. And these goals are not mutually exclusive, but they can be hard to affirm at the same time sometimes. On the one hand, we want to speak love and grace to hurting people. Love, grace. Are you hurting? Jesus loves you. Are you ashamed? Jesus died for that sin. Are you really just struggling? It's okay. God sees, he knows, and he's with you. We want to... We want to say that God will and does work in difficult situations. And on the other hand, we want to speak God's truth 
that we must affirm and value the bond of marriage and do all we can to build God relationships and to bring him glory and to mirror his love in our lives. Today I'm going to borrow a lot from Pastor John Hopler. If you read these or if you've been to a conference, you, you know a lot about John. He's a wonderful fella. I kind of hesitate to tell you that I'm borrowing him today because I'm changing a lot of it. And uh, please just give him credit for the good stuff and blame me for the rest of it. Amen. Uh, Aaron says, I do that every Sunday, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's been said that uh, marriage is more important than most of us realize. Marriage affects God's reputation on the planet. Marriage affects God's reputation on the planet. Brothers and sisters, when, when Christian people get a divorce, the world's watching. They say, well, what, God didn't work for you? What's going on there? When Christian people learn how to be good forgivers, they put up with difficult situations year after year. They're not quick to run. They stick with it. They forgive. They learn how to stay in a hard situation. Do you know what that does? That brings glory to our God. And people look at that and say, wow, that's different. And as the world embraces escape, easy escapism, and as the world says, I'm sick of this, I'm out of here more and more, do you know what? A Christian family, a Christian family that stays together, and, I'm, and a husband looks at a wife and says, I'm committed to you, and I ain't leaving, even though I'm really ticked off with you right now. And the, and the wife says, I'm not going. I'm not going to do it. Because I've been given a promise to the Lord. And the kids grew up in, in an atmosphere where mom and dad are not quitters and they're holding on tight to each other. That brings glory to our Heavenly Father. Guess what? There's a, a large part of our population today that doesn't even believe in love anymore. In, in, in a, I was, on a, I was in, a, in a, talk, a talk room, a chat room, and the majority of the people are saying, what's the purpose of marriage? Really, why would you promise your life to anybody? That doesn't even make any sense. Just have sex, get together, enjoy each other as long as you want. And as soon as it doesn't make sense, why would you stick around? And there was nobody, until I started saying a few things, nobody in the whole chat room who even had a good word to say about marriage. It used to be that you didn't have to be a Christian to, to believe in the romance of two people sticking it out together. Cyclone's coming. We're going to hold down this heart, house together. Wind's blowing hard. It's cold winds. We don't have much food in the cupboard. We're going to stick together, and we're going to make this work. Love is a beautiful thing, and as the world stops to believe in love, they're going to look at a husband and a wife that are forgiving each other and not giving up and sticking it out, and it's going to more and more shine a spotlight on Jesus Christ. Marriage, marriage is a powerful witness for Jesus Christ in the world. Marriage is difficult because... Well, look at yourself. You're difficult. Be honest. You are a difficult person to be with sometimes. We are sinners. We're fallen. We're broken. Broken people don't do wonderful things all the time. Newsflash, right? Broken people sometimes do broken things. Stupid people sometimes say stupid things. Marriage is hard. Because we're difficult. We're hard people to be around with sometimes. Uh, it's the same with uh, unity in the church. It's difficult to maintain because we're difficult people. Divorce is a reality in this world. And guess what? This book is not all Pollyannish. It's precious moments and all e nice, easy things. God has a lot to say about divorce. God has a lot to say about it. Uh, we're going to continue working through our way in Matthew. And this week we came to Matthew chapter 19. So that's where we're at. Please turn to Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 19. If you see Matthew chapter 20, go back a chapter and you'll find the right one. All right, when Jesus had finished saying these things, well, the context here is he just got talking about forgiveness. 
How many times would she, we should forgive one another? Jesus said, you better forgive each other again and again and again and again and again. Now, physically, the Pharisees are going to come and ask Jesus about divorce. They probably didn't know the conversation he just had. But in the flow of Scripture, isn't it significant? Right after God stressing forgiveness, he said, you've got to forgive the way I forgive, which is everything, always, again and again. The very next discussion in the book of Matthew is about divorce. It's about marriage. Because why? You cannot keep a friend unless you know how to forgive. And you cannot keep a church going unless you're a good forgiver. And you will never have a good marriage unless you're really good at forgiving. It's just key. And that's why our relationship with God hinges on God's ability to forgive, and God's ability to forgive is perfect. So when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Isn't that kind of funny? Why are they talking to Jesus? Because they want to get their lives right. No. Why do they come to Jesus? Because they've seen the beauty of his life and they want a part of that. No. Why do they want to talk to Jesus? They're, test they're trying to trip him up. Okay. I don't want to talk to you. Now, here's God. You could talk to God about marriage. He made Adam. He made Eve. God made the institution of marriage. You, we could come and talk to God and say, what's marriage all about? How can we make it work? Instead, they say, like, how can I get out of this? How can I get out of marriage? What, what, what are the grounds? And oftentimes when we approach Scripture, I'm going to harp on this today. When we approach Scripture, when we see the, the text for divorce, what we're reading is, okay, how can I get out of this? Okay, I want to be able to divorce and, and still be able to check the box that I did all the right things. And God is saying, no, this is about relationship. This is about love. This is about making things work. And we're more interested in legalism. How can I escape from something? Show me the rules so I can play the game. So they came to him, and they want to ask him how they can get out of divorce. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? She burnt the toast, God. How can I put up with this another day? You know, uh, just looking for any excuse to get out of marriage. Haven't you read... You ought to know better, Jesus is saying. You ought to know better. Haven't you read that at the beginning, that we're going right back to the start, at creation, at the beginning, the creator, God made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and leave his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, no longer two they're one. In some supernatural, spiritual way, two individuals are made one individual in God's eyes. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus goes right back to Adam and Eve, the very first human beings on the planet. Right back to Adam and Eve. God made them for each other. They came together. They became one and Jesus said, you know what? My heavenly father, he's like a matchmaker. He brought them together. This is romantic. This is beautiful. They're one now. If God put it together, nobody should break that apart. Nobody. In, instead of catching the romance of the beauty of what Jesus said, they're still on, I want to check some legalistic boxes. Why? Wait, 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 wait. You're talking about all that romance and the beauty of the relationship and the oneness. Let's get back to divorce. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give a wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Huh? How about that? Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce, you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. It's not the way it's supposed to be. But it was not this way at the beginning. In the beginning, the idea was no divorce. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and wife, it's better just not to get married because they're his disciples and they're really understanding this love thing. They're really into relationship. God is a God of relationship. 
He's coming, he's suffering, he's putting up with our garbage so that he can love us. And they're thinking, no, 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 I don't. I need to get away from this if it gets too hard. It's better not to get married if that's the case. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. There are eunuchs out there, you know, because they were born that way. Others have made themselves into eunuchs. Don't dwell on that too long. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. But if you can accept this thing about marriage and a husband and wife loving each other and stick it out, you should accept it. Earlier in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, It has been said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. God's law is not meant to be convenient. God takes marriage very seriously. God really, I mean, who does he think he is? God? He has no qualms about telling you, God, the situation is so difficult. Yeah, stay in it. Well, who does he think he is? He is God. He says things that, that uh, he thinks he has a right to say. Malachi 2.16 Yeah, well, you know, God's so nice and warm and fuzzy, he doesn't hate anything. He's just a sweetie. God just wants me to be happy, so he knows I can't be happy with this woman. I've got to get me that other gal. Malachi 2.16, I don't know how it's got in the Bible. It's obviously a mistake because it says God hates something. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Probably the prophet was just quoting somebody else by mistake, and he put God's name in there. Uh, what is that? God hates divorce. Everybody who gets divorced, you know why they do it? Well, not, I should take that back. Almost every Christian who gets a divorce says, I think God just wants me to be happy, and so he knows I can't be happy with this guy anymore. Malachi says, I hate divorce. We learn from Adam and Eve, this shockingly intimate picture, that the two become one. One flesh. No longer two. One. We learn from the prophet Malachi that God is the author of marriage, not the author of divorce. God hates divorce. When, when people come for counseling, one of the first things we get out of the way, but pre, premarital counseling, is you don't go into marriage thinking you can leave if you get tired of it. Marriage is for life. We learn from Jesus himself that marriage is supposed to be for life and that God is the matchmaker. What he puts together, we're not supposed to break apart. So that's very comforting. I can't, I can't stay on this situation, but God's the one who brought us together. So I need to, I need to learn what it means to honor him and, and stick it out. I need to put God's feelings before my own feelings. And it's also a very, very beautiful, romantic, fun thing to know that God has made us one. God did it. God is the one who made love. He's the one who made sex. He's the one who made laughter, the one who made joy. And God has brought us together, and his intent is that we stay together for this life. Again, we learn from Jesus. Jesus is the bride. The church is the bride, right? Jesus is the groom. Jesus has a lot of patience for his church, doesn't he? Jesus has a lot of patience. By the way, if you're a Christian, you say, I can be a Christian, but I don't need to be a part of the church. You're talking bad about his bride. How do you think he's going to feel about that? Jesus has patience for the bride. Jesus has forgiveness again and again and again. For his bride, he models for us a heart that does not give up on the wife, on the bride. Jesus laid down his life. He gave up his rights to save the bride. Jesus does not divorce his bride. 
When you become a Christian, you are safe in the hands of God. He's not going to lose you. He's not going to throw you away. He's not going to get tired of you. He, now, you might think, oh, he might get tired of me. You are wrong. He is not going to get tired of you. Jesus does not divorce the bride. Now, if this is the heart of God, and this is the kind of love he's modeling for us, and he tells us how many times should we should forgive, well, again and again and again, then if you've got to forgive and again and again, on what grounds do we have to leave? Jesus does not divorce his bride, and God the Father doesn't want any of his sons or daughters to get divorced either. Now, we're not going to touch on this today. The Bible has a lot to talk about divorce. Divorce in the case of sexual morality. Uh, divorce in the case of abandonment. Divorce uh, in the Old Testament, there was actually a passage where God commanded people to get a divorce because they were married to non-believers who were going to bring down the, the, the country. Now, in the New Testament, it's not that way anymore. When you're married to a non-Christian, God commands you to stay with them. However, if they leave, you don't have to chase them down. You can let them go. So, and then there's, you can remarry in the case of if you're divor- uh, the part person you divorced had themselves remarried or if they've died. There's, there's a lot of rules, 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 rules here. I don't even care about all the rules right now. God hates divorce. We got to work at good marriages and stop being a legalistic and looking for ways out. Start looking at ways to preserve it. Start finding ways to honor God through your relationship. The disciples took Christ's words the wrong way. They focused on what they can't do. We can't divorce our wives. It's better not to be married. Jesus was emphasizing a beautiful union, incredible oneness that's supposed to stand the test of time. A husband and a wife that put up with one another, that love each other, that grow closer over time will glorify the Lord and stop looking for different rules and how we can get out of it. The Pharisees missed it. The disciples missed it. Brothers and sisters, let's not miss it. Let's not miss it. Christ spoke romantically about matches made in heaven. These are not Pastor Dan's words. These are God's words. God came in flesh, and here's what he had to say. What God has joined together, let no man break apart. What God has joined together, let no man break apart. You're in it for life. You're in it for life, for life. What God has brought together, let no man break apart. The Pharisees were too busy being legalists to catch the love. The apostles, the apostles. Well, if that's the way marriage is, it's better not to get married. They had a lot to learn, didn't they? They had a lot to learn. They wanted to know the rules. They wanted to know how they could get out. Jesus was focused on staying together. Because that's what God's focused on. God came to earth because we took off. He said, honey, I want to chase you down. And we got in debt. He said, honey, I'm going to pay that debt for you. And we don't have the time of day for him. He says, I've got eternity for you. He pursues us with a relentless love, and he wants our love in small ways to learn how to be like him. He puts up with a lot of garbage from us. Be honest. He puts up with so much from me. Has your Savior put up with a lot from you? We're supposed to be like him, and one way we do that is not writing each other off in the church, not writing our friends off, and not writing our spouses off. Because the way a husband loves his wife is supposed to be like Jesus laid down his life for the church. And a wife is supposed to honor and respect her husband the way we honor our head, our spiritual head, Jesus Christ. And the way a husband and wife forgive each other is supposed to look like the way God forgives us. In the, way, in the way a husband and wife are in it for eternity and for, for life is the way God says, I'm not going to give up on you guys. Our marriage is an echo. Sometimes good echoes, sometimes not a good echo. It's an echo of the great marriage between our Savior who gave his heart, gave his life, gave up everything in order to win himself a bride. Because he looked down at us the Bible says he shouts over us with shouts of joy. He looked down at us in our brokenness, said, I gotta get me one of those. I gotta get, I gotta get me a bride. He came down to save us, and he's not gonna let us go. Brothers and sisters, don't let your husband go. Don't let your wife go. Stick in it. 
stay with it. And that's the way God wants it to be. So there's a lot of rules I could have got into, and there, there are grounds. There's grounds for separation, but not divorce. There's a lot of stuff that God does teach us. If you have some questions, I'd be happy to go over it with you. But the gist of what we see in Scripture is God hates divorce. Go make it work, because when you do, it brings me glory. Does that make a lot of sense? that make a lot of sense? Let's pray. Lord God, we're weak. Uh, we're sometimes so messed up. Lord, sometimes we feel like we want to run. Lord, if we've got to run, help us to run to you. Help us to run into your embrace. Father, we need to know grace. If we don't know your grace, how are we going to have grace for one another? And if we don't know that you're patient with us when we're so foolish, how can we be patient with people when they've wronged us, Lord? God, please take us in our brokenness and make us more like you. Father, today I want to ask, let every husband here work really hard at being a joy and blessing to his wife. Help, help him to be an encourager. Help her to, to support her, to, to, to be there for her. Father, I pray for every woman here that's married, Lord. Help her, help her Lord, to be a good helpmate for her husband, to bring him joy, to, to help him get up and, and get after life and not to give up. And, and Father, for all of us, we've got such massive egos, Lord, and they don't serve us. They don't do anything good for us, Lord. Help us to set aside the pride and the ego. And Father, we're here and we want to make our marriages work. We want to make our church family work. We want to make, we want to live lives your way, Lord, and, and our pride gets in the way. So Father, please, uh, please let your Holy Spirit just take a hold of us. We want to surrender to you, Lord. Show your glory through us. Help us to love. Help us to forgive. Help us to be patient. Everything good and beautiful, Lord, it's all yours, Father. And we're not going to get anywhere by turning our back on you. Thank you, God, that you're a God of grace. Thank you, God, that you're a healer of broken hearts. And thank you, God, that you give us your words that we know how you want us to live. Help us to follow your example. Help us to hold on tight to Jesus. Help us hold on tight to each other. And help us not to let go. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.